15-year-old Sierra Lamar vanished mysteriously while walking to her bus stop in Morgan Hill on March 16, 2012. Her unusual disappearance alarmed her family and friends, who sensed something terrible had happened. They uncovered a disturbing series of clues that, over the following months, led to a chilling narrative involving a deeply troubled individual. Today, we'll delve into Sierra Lamar's case and the compelling forensic evidence that secured a conviction despite her body never being found. Stay with us until the end. This is one of the most twisted true crime stories you'll ever hear. This is the case of Sierra Lamar. California is where our current story starts. A little city called Fremont can be found in the San Francisco Bay Area. Having been established in the 1840s, the Fremont region grew significantly during the California Gold Rush, and of course, much has changed since then. Fremont today has more than 230,000 residents, but it used to be just a post office with acreage for farming grapes, nursery plants, and olives. You might be familiar with the city because of its Bay Area rapid transport system, which shuttles citizens throughout the area and into the neighboring city of San Francisco. But aside from that, Fremont's reputation is generally quiet. In actuality, there is really nothing to discuss. Fremont is home to a Tesla manufacturing plant that employs over 15,000 people. Despite the fact that there is evidence that mammoths lived here over 2 million years ago, it also has a number of historically significant American structures, including the Mission San Jose Cemetery, Shin Arboretum, and Nile Silent Film Museum. Given that this peaceful city is renowned as San Francisco's quiet younger brother, you'd be lucky to learn any additional intriguing information about the region. But that would alter for all the wrong reasons in March 2012. As we focus on the Lamar family, who reside in Fremont, California, we learn more about our current tale. Steve, a father and computer expert, his wife Marlene, and their two daughters made up the four-person household. Sierra, the youngest daughter, was born on October 19, 1996, while Danielle, her older sister, was around four years her senior. Both girls experienced a relatively comfortable upbringing. They experienced ups and downs, just like every family. Behind closed doors, though, there was a very unsettling fact. When Danielle and Sierra were younger, their father engaged in inappropriate sexual behavior with one of their school classmates during a sleepover. When discovered, Steve pleaded no contest to indecent actions with a child. Naturally, this led to his one-year imprisonment, and the discovery rightly tore the family apart. Despite Steve's prior convictions, Sierra and Danielle said they got along well with him and that he had always been a kind and respected father. But when Steve and Marlene heard the news, they quickly decided to call it quits because their relationship was already over. She soon got herself a new man. Following this, both Sierra and Danielle attended Washington High School in their community, where they had a great time socializing and did okay in school. Sierra, a happy-go-lucky girl, was described as such. She was highly liked at school and was fun-loving, vivacious, and kind. She loved dancing in competitions and cheerleading. Marlene eventually decided to relocate from Fremont to Morgan Hill, which is situated about 40 miles, 60 kilometers, southwest of the city. She moved to Morgan Hill with Sierra and her boyfriend Rick Gardner in October 2011. Money was still scarce for Rick, who worked in the construction sector, even if business was coming up. The trio relocated to a rented ranch-style home on Pedo Hispanic Court, a rural cul-de-sac bordered by agricultural land. Now it goes without saying that Sierra was very disappointed to be leaving her close friends and her hobbies behind and relocating to a place where she knew no one. She was well-liked at Washington High, but Sobredo High School didn't treat her with exactly the same warmth. However, as time went on, Sierra settled nicely at Sobredo High. She finally established friends, won the respect of her peers, and even rejoined the cheerleading squad. Fast forward five months, and Sierra had successfully adapted to the area by March 2012. On March 11th, she called her parents, who were still living in Fremont, to update them on her progress. The discussion was mostly joyful. She was enthusiastic about one of her forthcoming school tasks, mentioned wanting to get her hair colored the next time she went to Fremont and told her sister all about her homework. She was obviously doing quite well in her academics. Sierra ended the chat with Danielle and Steve shortly after dinner. 
Because it was a Thursday, she had school the next day, and it was getting late. They all agreed to part ways for the evening and promised to speak again soon. However, none of them realized that this would be Danielle and Steve's final conversation with Sierra. February 16, 2012. It was an ordinary workday back in Morgan Hill. The Gardner Lamar family got ready for the day as usual. Around 6 o'clock in the morning, Rick awoke to head out to work. Shortly after, Marlene arrived to kiss Sierra on the forehead before heading out to work as well. Sierra had to get ready for school and lock the house. At this point, at 6.29 a.m., she tweeted a friend before putting on her shoes and walking out the front door to catch the bus. Pedo Hispanic Court, as you can see, was located very far from Sobredo High School and the rest of Morgan Hill. Sierra had to cross a desolate road between Palm and Dory Avenues every morning to catch the bus, just like many other children across America. While on the move, at 7.11 a.m., she texted a friend to see if they could meet up before classes started. But when her school bus arrived at 7.15 a.m., just four minutes later, Sierra was nowhere to be seen. Maybe worse than missing the bus, Sierra skipped class or maybe school altogether because she didn't meet up with her pal. Sierra hadn't turned up for school, which her pals thought was weird, but none of them felt it wise enough to inform the school. Without her, the day continued as normal. Marlene contacted Sierra as usual when the school day came to a conclusion to see how she was doing. Even though she found it strange that Sierra's phone went directly to voicemail, she didn't become upset. But when she got home and saw that her daughter's room was still vacant, she realized something wasn't right. She contacted Steve to see if Sierra was planning to visit him in Vermont again, which would have been bothersome but not dreadful. This sadly wasn't the case either. They all left the same message when Sierra called Danielle and a few of her friends. Marlene started to freak out when she called Sobredo High School and found out she had missed all of her classes. I talked to her, said goodbye, and gave her a hug, and things were good. I told her I loved her. I can't believe that she would not contact her friends and let them know that she's okay and do this. She would never want us to go through all this pain. Officers were sent right away to Pedo Hispanic Court after calling the authorities. But because Sierra could have vanished at any time, there was no clear place for investigators to begin. Those nearest to Sierra went first. This naturally included a number of her friends, who were all very honest about the predicament Sierra and her family were in. Even though she was normally content, it had only been a few months since her mother's divorce had compelled her to leave her family and all of her old friends behind. Authorities believe that because she frequently made lighthearted and even serious comments about returning to Vermont, she had most likely left voluntarily. Despite the fact that police downplayed Sierra's disappearance, other factors were moving in the exact opposite direction. She didn't only say nothing. She also stopped posting anything to her social media accounts. She never arrived at the front door. Her phone was off, and all calls went to voicemail. Naturally, Sierra's loved ones and friends were terrified. Thus, the massive search for Sierra Lamar got underway. Despite ineffective police attempts, the trail of evidence left in relation to Sierra's disappearance is currently one of the longest, most intricate, and most fascinating I've ever covered. On Sunday morning, two days after she vanished, it all began. Data forensics were examining her phone's previous data when they discovered that it had sent without a single electrical ping in the middle of the night. The phone appeared to be turned on for a brief period of time before turning off again, and the coordinates on the phone were directing them to a field near Sierra's house. At dawn, a search crew meticulously scoured over the fields where the phone had been pinged. After just a few minutes of looking, they discovered it. The Samsung Galaxy that Sierra was using was close to the road. Given its length and the physical harm it had sustained, it was assumed that it must have been flung off the road. Investigators came to the conclusion that she had not physically turned on her phone that evening. Instead, they reasoned that the rain had caused a false charge signal, briefly turning on her phone. What a fortunate coincidence this was. The conclusion of the story relies heavily on the authorities. Discovering her phone and everything that occurred was caused by a raindrop and a short circuit. Given the nature and circumstances of the case, detectives found the likelihood that her phone was thrown from a moving vehicle to be particularly troubling. 
given the lack of footprints, tire track marks, or any other visual evidence. The next day brought about yet another horrifying discovery. Two kilometers from Sierra's house, a search crew found her backpack thrown just outside a barn. She had expected to go to school and was probably pushed away from her essential items because the bag included her schoolwork, inhaler, and money. Sadly, things only got worse from here. Additionally, a complete outfit, maybe the one she was wearing the morning she vanished, was found in her luggage. This ensemble featured her pullover, pants, socks, shoes, and even undergarments. Her outfit was subjected to DNA testing, and the results were promising. Her pants contained male foreign DNA, which suggested that she had likely been assaulted. Although the search had already intensified significantly in the days following Sierra's disappearance, the discovery of her phone and clothing sparked a fresh outpouring of local and international sympathy. Authorities received more than 1,000 fresh tips, and officers worked more than 7,000 hours. Several search teams were composed of more than 800 individuals. They examined every available lake and reservoir in the area, methodically calmed over fields, and looked inside abandoned buildings. Sierra's name was a hot topic in the community, and posters for missing people were put up all over the place. Additionally, Sierra's parents offered a $10,000 reward to anyone with credible proof. However, despite their best efforts and those of the community, just a golf ball and a flipper were discovered. Investigators were actually getting closer to a potential culprit, although the public was unaware of this at the time. Twelve days after Sierra vanished, on March 28, an examination revealed that the DNA found on her pants belonged to a local man. All 57 of the listed sexual offenders who lived in the Morgan Hill Zieppi Code were looked into, and their DNA was compared to the sample. For the record, Sierra's father contacted law enforcement about his prior crimes as soon as his daughter vanished, and he was quickly eliminated as a suspect. He was a registered offender and wanted them to know that instead of doing the background check and finding out anyway, he thought it would be better and more efficient for the investigation to focus more on others. However, a local man by the name of Anin Garcia Torres was one of those men who had not been ruled out. Following a successful DNA match between himself and Sierra's pants, the 21-year-old man initially came to public attention. Annan, his mother, his then-pregnant wife, and their daughter resided in Maple Leaf RV Park, about seven miles from Sierra's house. Additionally, Annan's past is at best troubling. He had an extremely challenging upbringing marked by abuse and neglect. His drunken, abusive father had at least once threatened to kill both his mother and him before he was ultimately detained and imprisoned for molesting a young member of a family. Unfortunately, Annan's father passed on this terrible trait to him. Although the allegations against him for having sex with a minor in 2009 were ultimately dismissed, his DNA had been gathered as a result. Additionally, he was detained in 2010 for impeding police operations. The suspicious relationship between Sierra and Anning caused detectives to place him under constant watch. Nobody knew if Sierra was still alive or not, however, Anning was the most likely to know at this specific moment. The officers thus took a number of steps to keep an eye on his whereabouts and means of communication. His phone was tapped, a GPS tracker was covertly placed in his car, and two undercover police investigators shifted into an RV next to his house. After finding that the RV park had cameras at the front door, investigators also started looking through security footage from the neighborhood around an inn. They examined this film on the day of her disappearance to determine whether Annan had left or arrived home. As it turned out, Annan had left the campground in his red Volkswagen Jetta at 7 o'clock a.m. on the morning she vanished. Since there were only seven miles separating his home from Sierra's, Anin's travel time was a perfect match for the period during which Sierra could have been kidnapped. Even though Anin had departed for work at the normal time, Safeway's shift records showed that he did not show up for work on March 16. When his management inquired further, they discovered additional unfavorable information. It turns out that just three years prior, three unsuccessful kidnapping attempts had occurred in this Safeway's parking lot. Thankfully, None of the perpetrators were ever formally recognized or detained. The only piece of evidence from each of these attempted kidnappings was a taser that the perpetrator had dropped. One of its batteries had a fingerprint on it, 
However, it was only a portion of a fingerprint, and only a direct one-to-one -one comparison could match it. The thought seemed alluring, but when Annan's fingerprints were compared to those on the taser, a startling realization emerged. In reality, their suspect was Annan. The suspect was now in the hands of the investigators. He was positively identified as being present when Sierra vanished. His DNA was discovered on her pants, and he has a history of involvement in kidnappings. This was sufficient to detain him, question him, and seize his automobile for DNA testing. In spite of Annan's arrogance during the interview, the test results were fairly damaging. Actually, he was rather dismissive when questioned. He stated that the day Sierra vanished he went fishing, that he had no idea who Sierra was, and that he was certain they would not discover anything. However, Anin did not end his interview before making a very peculiar revelation. It turns out Anin admitted to having the somewhat vile habit of masturbating while driving and tossing the tissue out the window. Additionally, he asserted that he had tossed out a used tissue in the precise spot where Sierra's bag was discovered on the morning she vanished. We already had a probability of one in a million with the rain on Sierra's phone, and the cops also didn't believe his absurd explanation. And in Garcia Torres was formally detained on May 21, 2012, in connection with the disappearance of Sierra Lamar outside of his place of employment in a Safeway parking lot. This resulted from a number of distinct linkages between Sierra and Anning's vehicle. Her DNA was found on the interior door handle of the car's rear door, according to a DNA examination. Additionally, fibers from Anning's car seats matched those found on Sierra's clothing and a piece of rope discovered inside his car included a hair strand from Sierra. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had been in his car at some point. But even after his arrest, the situation still had a serious flaw. Even though it might have looked evident what had happened to Sierra, her body had yet to be discovered. Could they really accuse Annan of first-degree murder in the absence of a body or a death that had been verified? Yes. In reality, Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeff Rawson said on May 19, 2014, that he would be requesting the death penalty against Annan. Although Annan had previously entered a plea of not guilty to killing Sierra, there was little to no room for error given the overwhelming body of evidence that pointed to his guilt all the way to the end. After being delayed, Annan's trial finally got underway on January 30, 2017. The trial was drawn out and stressful for all parties with long arguments from the prosecution and defense during the more than 13 weeks of testimony. The defense team for Annan tried to make the case that his exposure to pesticides from surrounding fields as a child may have psychologically affected his cognitive capacities, and as a result, this was not and money. Sadly, things only got worse from here. Additionally, a complete outfit, maybe the one she was wearing the morning she vanished, was found in her luggage. This ensemble featured her pullover, pants, socks, shoes, and even undergarments. Her outfit was subjected to DNA testing, and the results were promising. Her pants contained male foreign DNA, which suggested that she had likely been assaulted. Although the search had already intensified significantly in the days following Sierra's disappearance, the discovery of her phone and clothing sparked a fresh outpouring of local and international sympathy. Authorities received more than 1,000 fresh tips, and officers worked more than 7,000 hours. Several search teams, composed of more than 800 individuals, examined every available lake and reservoir in the area, methodically calmed over fields, and looked inside abandoned buildings. Sierra's name was a hot topic in the community, and posters for missing people were put up all over the place. Additionally, Sierra's parents offered a $10,000 reward to anyone with credible proof. However, Despite their best efforts and those of the community, just a golf ball and a flipper were discovered. Investigators were actually getting closer to a potential culprit, although the public was unaware of this at the time. Twelve days after Sierra vanished, on March 28, an examination revealed that the DNA found on her pants belonged to a local man. All 57 of the listed sexual offenders who lived in the Morgan Hill Ziepi Code were looked into, and their DNA was compared to the sample. For the record, Sierra's father contacted law enforcement about his prior crimes as soon as his daughter vanished, and he was quickly eliminated as a suspect. However, 
a local man by the name of Antolin Garcia Torres was one of those men who had not been ruled out following a successful DNA match between himself and Sierra's pants. The 21-year-old man initially came to public attention. Antolin, his mother, his then-pregnant wife, and their daughter resided in Maple Leaf RV Park, about seven miles from Sierra's house. Additionally, Antolin's past is at best troubling. He had an extremely challenging upbringing marked by abuse and neglect. His drunken, abusive father had at least once threatened to kill both his mother and him. That was before he was ultimately detained and imprisoned for molesting a young member of a family. Unfortunately, Antolin's father passed on this terrible trait to him. Although the allegations against him for having sex with a minor in 2009 were ultimately dismissed, his DNA had been gathered as a result. Additionally, he was detained in 2010 for impeding police operations. The suspicious relationship between Sierra and Antolin caused detectives to place him under constant watch. Nobody knew if Sierra was still alive or not, however. Antolin was the most likely to know at this specific moment. The officers thus took a number of steps to keep an eye on his whereabouts and means of communication. His phone was tapped, a GPS tracker was covertly placed in his car, and two undercover police investigators shifted into an RV next to his house. After finding that the RV park had cameras at the front door, investigators also started looking through security footage from the neighborhood around Antolin. They examined this film on the day of her disappearance to determine whether Antolin had left or arrived home. As it turned out, Antolin had left the campground in his red Volkswagen Jetta at 7 o'clock a.m. on the morning she vanished. Since there were only seven miles separating his home from Sierra's, Antolin's travel time was a perfect match for the period during which Sierra could have been kidnapped. Even though Antolin had departed for work at the normal time, Safeway's shift records showed that he did not show up for work on March 16. When his management inquired further, they discovered additional unfavorable information. It turns out that just three years prior, three unsuccessful kidnapping attempts had occurred in this Safeway's parking lot. Thankfully, none of the perpetrators were ever formally recognized or detained. The only piece of evidence from each of these attempted kidnappings was a taser that the perpetrator had dropped. One of its batteries had a fingerprint on it, however, it was only a portion of a fingerprint, and only a direct one-to-one -one comparison could match it. The thought seemed alluring, but when Antolin's fingerprints were compared to those on the taser, a startling realization emerged. In reality, their suspect was Antolin. The suspect was now in the hands of the investigators. He was positively identified as being present when Sierra vanished. His DNA was discovered on her pants, and he has a history of involvement in kidnappings. This was sufficient to detain him, question him, and seize his automobile for DNA testing. In spite of Antolin's arrogance during the interview, the test results were fairly damaging. Actually, he was rather dismissive when questioned. He stated that the day Sierra vanished he went fishing, that he had no idea who Sierra was, and that he was certain they would not discover anything. However, Antolin did not end his interview before making a very peculiar revelation. Antolin, it turns out, admitted to having the somewhat vile habit of strangling the snake while driving and tossing the poor tissue out the window. Additionally, he asserted that he had tossed out a used tissue in the precise spot where Sierra's bag was discovered on the morning she vanished. We already had a probability of one in a million with the rain on Sierra's phone, and the cops also didn't believe his absurd explanation. Antolin Garcia Torres was formally detained on May 21, 2012, in connection with the disappearance of Sierra Lamar outside of his place of employment in a Safeway parking lot. This resulted from a number of distinct linkages between Sierra and Antolin's vehicle. Her DNA was found on the interior door handle of the car's rear door, according to a DNA examination. Additionally, fibers from Antolin's car seats matched those found on Sierra's clothing and a piece of rope discovered inside his car included a hair strand from Sierra. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had been in his car at some point. But even after his arrest, the situation still had a serious flaw. Even though it might have looked evident what had happened to Sierra, her body had yet to be discovered. Could they really accuse Antolin of first-degree murder in the absence of a body or a death that had been verified? Yes, in reality, 
Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeff Rosen said on May 19, 2014, that he would be requesting the death penalty against Antolin. Although Antolin had previously entered a plea of not guilty to killing Sierra, there was little to no room for error given the overwhelming body of evidence that pointed to his guilt all the way to the end. After being delayed, Antolin's trial finally got underway on January 30, 2017. The trial was drawn out and stressful for all parties, with long arguments from the prosecution and defense during the more than 13 weeks of testimony. The defense team for Antolin tried to make the case that his exposure to pesticides from surrounding fields as a child may have psychologically affected his cognitive capacities, and as a result, this was not his fault, which I considered to be an interesting aspect of the trial. Additionally, they argued that he shouldn't be eligible for the death penalty because he had nothing to do with that toxic exposure and under those circumstances. They were going to say that it was something that he couldn't help and that it was a deficit that he faced as a young man that other people didn't face. So this testimony from the expert was designed to go after his mental state and to say that he didn't have a normal childhood and, additionally, he was subjected to exposure to toxic chemicals which could have affected his decision-making process and his brain function at a very organic level. In a last-ditch effort, Antolin's defense team asked for a new trial after casting doubt on the reliability and honesty of the chief investigator and asserting that he had tampered with evidence in the past. This motion, though, was turned down. The jury convicted Antolin Garcia Torres of Sierra Lamar's first-degree murder on May 9, 2017. The evidence was so overwhelming against Antolin that he was unable to escape responsibility for his acts. Even though Sierra's body has never been located and her death has not been proven, Sierra's mother addressed him directly in court and declared, I find it inconceivable to do a horrific violent crime. As numerous of Sierra's kin read letters to him in the courtroom, Antolin remained quiet and motionless, and he has continued to insist that he is innocent of killing Sierra. It follows that he has never said where Sierra's body might be, and regrettably, nobody knows what exactly happened to her on the day that she vanished outside of the evidence offered. Antolin was formally given a life sentence without the chance of parole after being spared the death penalty, which is a remarkable accomplishment when you consider that no body has ever been discovered. Since his sentencing, Antolin has stayed largely silent, and despite receiving hundreds of letters from news organizations and total strangers, only one letter has been answered. Actually, I'm not sure why Antolin continues to maintain his innocence. This is as obvious as day because of his DNA on Sierra's possessions. Sierra's DNA in his car, his prior criminal history, and a precise timeline. At least it was crystal clear that he was involved in Sierra's disappearance. There is no way she would still be missing if she were still alive, claim friends and family. As I typically do in these tales, there were a number of sinister and intriguing facets to this one. On June 19, 2012, three months after she had vanished, phony images of Sierra's Facebook account were circulated online, showing her sending a number of updates claiming to be being kept captive and in need of assistance. What type of sick person does this, though? This was eventually shown to be a hoax. However, there was a legitimate instance of grim irony. The night before Sierra vanished, she reposted a tweet with the following message. According to some organizers, the attempt to find Sierra was the longest continuous search for an individual in U.S. history. Over a period of three years, volunteers carried out over 1,000, 100 searches within a 15-mile radius, putting in a combined 50,000 man-hours of search effort in search of any information about the missing young woman. They endured sweltering summer days, rainy fall evenings, and chilly winter nights. Even now, volunteers continue to search desperately for Sierra Lamar. The majority of them are aware that Sierra is probably dead, but they still want to return her to her family and give them the closure they need. Nobody is sure where Sierra's body may be at this time, but hopefully one day the Lamar family will receive closure. Folks, that very much concludes the argument for today. I appreciate you watching another video. Please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already if you found this case interesting or learned something new. As always, if you have any comments or questions about this case, please do so in the section below. I'll talk to you soon about another video.
please remember to take care of one another and keep safe until we run into each other again. Thank you and goodbye.